All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Okay, let's begin this time with prayer and then we'll get into our sessions. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for yet another week and another opportunity to come together and learn. And Lord, even as we learn about the local church, we pray that you give us wisdom, give us revelation, understanding, Lord, that even as we learn, Lord, that you will just pour out your spirit into our hearts, oh God, that we will learn and everything that we learn, we'll apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so last week we looked at uh, the sacraments of the church. Uh, so two main aspects that we looked at was uh, water baptism and the Lord's table, right? So now let's get into chapter 20. And now from chapter 20, we will look at uh, a lot of practical things that you and I will have to do as leaders, right? Now, not only in the pastoral or in the local church, but no matter what, uh, wherever we are, uh, uh, that God has called us for, uh, there are practical aspects that are involved when we talk about ministry, right? So the spiritual aspect is what praying, preparing, preaching, as a spiritual aspect. But you must also understand that ministry is about people, and people, you know, there are different kinds of people, and we have to deal with people. Right? You have to deal with them. You, we cannot say, you know, this become like Jesus and end the story. We have to deal with people. So we're going to look at chapter 20, resolving, sorry, uh, church discipline. When we look at church discipline, now as, as in a school, what is important? I just went to drop my kid to school. If you're five minutes late, the gate is locked. And the, the parent has to go all the way to the principal, write a letter. Now, is it good? For me, it's inconvenient, but it's a good thing. It's discipline. You're, you know, you're maintaining discipline for the school, for the children. Now, in this chapter, we look at what the scriptures teach us on the matters of church discipline. Firstly, resolving conflicts now we'll just read a few verses matthew 18 15 to 22 uh, we'll not read the entire portion but just uh, just go ahead and read it and i'll stop you in between matthew 18 15 onwards matthew 18 15 to 22 moreover if you br your brother sins against you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone if he hears you you have gained your brother but if he will not hear take with you one or more two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established yeah just stop there now jesus is very beautifully bringing out this illustration he's saying if your brother sins against you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone so that means if somebody is got a you know is upset with me or somebody has sinned or I have sinned against somebody, I go and try to resolve the matter one on one. Now, even after that, they don't hear, he goes on. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Such a beautiful example. Jesus is saying. There will be conflicts. Even Jesus knows it. Right? He's saying when you have problems with each other as believers, go resolve it one on one. If it's still not resolved, take two or three witnesses together and resolve the matter. Now, as a pastor and a leader, people will come to you with problems among themselves. What is the first thing that we must do? Remember this. Encourage people to look at what Jesus said. Point them to Jesus. Let's follow the instructions as what Jesus said. Try and resolve the matter peacefully. If the matter does not resolve peacefully, you will have to bring two or three witnesses, get them together, get the leaders of the church together, resolve the matter. Our main aim is forgiveness, reconciliation. 
right? Now, if either of the parties involved refuses to hear what the leaders say of the church, they can be released from this fellowship because it will not profit for strife, unforgiveness, and division to continue. Think of this. Now, for example, in a local church, there are problems between two families. Now they'll come to you. This family said this. So what do we do? First, we try and resolve the matter one on one. Say, no, they shouldn't have said this. The matter is going on, right? It's not being resolved. Then you can bring some elders within the church, bring a few witnesses, sit together and say, listen, I know this is a this has happened. He has said something in anger, or they have said something uh, rude. But as believers, we should aim for forgiveness, for reconciliation. Now, even after this, both the parties decide, no, I'm never going to forgive this person, or I'm never going to listen to him. What does it say here? It is good that they be released from the fellowship itself. That means, as a leader, you and I will have to make the decision to say, OK, so we tried two ways. One on one, I spoke to you. I brought witnesses. We tried reconciliation. We tried to patch up things. But you both, two families, you are not willing to listen. There's still anger and strife between each other. Important thing is to let them go out of the fellowship. That means very, um, in a very non-confrontational way, let them know that they can go and look for another church. And this is going to be one of the hardest decisions that we will have to make as a leader. But why is this important? Imagine you've got two families who have come, and every Sunday they are seeing each other. Now this family will go and tell five other families their part of the story. This other family will go tell five of their families another part of the story. Now what's happening within the church? Groupism, division, gossip, backbiting, everything starts. Why? Because of two families. Now let me give you this example. It happened in you know, when we were in, in Mangalore, there was this couple, an elderly couple. Uh, they were part of another church, but then they started coming to our church. And that time we were just maybe about 50, 60 people. But a lot of uh, couples were there. Now, they started having a problem with one of the couples in the church. And, and they came and told me, you know, this is what the problem is I said, so the problem was you know they they felt that you know they're not talking properly to them i said no so we talked and we tried to figure it out they said no nothing i just say hi see that person is an introvert he doesn't talk too much but this man got offended and he said as a pastor you're not a good pastor you are you know you're already a small boy you're telling me i said see relax the point is, we need to be in one heart, one mind. But I got to know that this pastor is going and telling everyone in the church, you know, uh, uh, this, this church is not good. We don't like the worship in this church. The preaching is not good. They have a wrong doctrine. And it just spread within the church. I got to know. So the first thing I said is, I, I called him. I said, did you say all of this? He said, no. So I immediately called the other family and I said, come here. They came. I said, did you say this to them? The other family said, yeah, he said it straight on my face. And he, this family is saying, where's the proof? How do you know I've said? I said, no proof at all. What they are saying is you said this. And from what I'm looking at it, you have a problem with me. right? Uh, you don't want me to be here because I'm too small or too young to be a pastor, whatever. But here's the thing. If you want to stay here, you have to stop all your gossip. Now, he got very upset because I said that. Who are you to tell me? Who do you think you are? I know the Bible. I know I've been to many churches. He got upset. But he still would come Sundays. 
finally he wrote an email saying you know paul is not a good pastor paul should be taken out from the pastoral role all of it and then when he wrote that email surprisingly we we asked him we replied back we asked him give us the reasons why you feel this so he didn't get a response we didn't get a response from him and so he thought that you know i will be taken out uh, as a pastor but eventually what happened was as as a pastoral team we, were, we all sat and uh, and pastor said called him called me said today onwards don't come to this church today paul front of me front of the families you don't come to church go find another church and exit out of the whatsapp group as of today i was surprised but i understood why but they were very offended they started saying all kinds of things no apc is a false church and this and that all kinds of things they started saying they are speaking from a place of hurt <clears throat> but we had to ask them to leave and we told them don't come here later on we got to know this couple is a problem trouble makers in every church every year they going to one one church and but anyways we didn't bother about that everything was resolved in the church and you know i spoke to the church people i said this is the reason why we've asked them to exit out of the church um uh, and it was hard it was a hard decision but it was important because we protected the church after that you know the church was perfectly fine no problem no gossip no nothing was happening everyone loved each other in the church right uh and so there will be times we will have to resolve conflicts some guidance in dealing with such matters okay one page 190 if possible or necessary have a team of one or more elders or a team of people qualified experience both in spiritual aspects and practical aspects so as your church is growing it will be good to have teams right now uh, especially if they are spiritually matured or they are you know they have good knowledge uh, practical aspects how to relate to situation so for example there's somebody in church who is a senior manager now as a senior manager he knows how to deal with people right plus he's been with the lord for the last 20 years so i can have this person as a as a core team member say you know so i can get guidance from him he can tell me you know what while dealing with people you 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 try this you talk this way right now again the decision is as a leader i'll have to make the decision but they will be able to give us inputs on how to uh, you know uh, deal with people two make it clear that all decisions will be made without partiality and based on god's word so there can be a couple in the church or anyone attending church for the past 10 years and somebody attending church for one year and these two have a problem don't immediately say hey no he's been there 10 years so i have to support him no even though he's been there for 10 years he could be wrong Yes or no? Right? He could be wrong. Maybe this person who's there for one year is way more sp spiritually matured than the person who is there for ten years. So every decision should be made without partiality. Three, put everything down in writing so that no one claiming anything different later on. Very important. You know this happened, and I and I thank God for you know just protecting me that day. we were starting a church location a new location and so people came up to me in the church and said hey we want to support you we want to you know, we wanted to start uh, so we have the apc mangalore church and we have the uh, branch church deralakate which we wanted to start uh, so people in the main church said we will we will help you out uh, tell us what you need we you need chairs you need uh, you know um, uh, sound system stage cables mics whatever you need let us know i said see don't worry you know uh, we apc bangalore 
the funds will come and so they we will do the work from there they said no 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 we want to help you and one person came to me and gave me a check like you know i said uh, this is an amount i want to give you and that moment i said take this amount take it with you deposit the amount in a in the church account and say this is for apc mangalo he said okay i'll do it so that guy came with cash giving it to me i said no deposit the amount in the church account say it's for apc mangalo new branch and then i'll talk to the accountant we'll get that worked out then people started saying i i'll pay for the chairs i'll buy a table i'll buy five three mics i'll buy one guitar now i realize okay i have to be very careful now I open an excel sheet i wrote down the name how much they are willing to transfer the transaction number what they have transferred the amount transaction number and the reason for what they have transferred put it all in an excel sheet including bucket for the restroom i wrote it down somebody has paid for restroom accessories whatever is needed even that i put down everything even a 10 rupee item i put it down on that excel sheet after putting everything down we planted the church everything uh, everything started all of a sudden one one couple said you know we we uh, supported for that church we don't know where the funds are thought to myself what is this first thing i did is i opened the excel sheet i said everything is available and before that what i did was that excel sheet i had transferred i had emailed it to uh, all our past to our pastor and also to our elders in the church so this guy, this uh, this man from the church wrote and said we don't know where where are the funds got but everyone luckily already knew what came in what was spent everything so then the, he he called and said we don't know where the funds were sent before starting the church everything has been approved everything has been put in the excel he had no way to try and trap i think of this there will be people like this in ministry so we should be wise yes because it's ministry don't feel okay everything will be no right you got to be wise how you do things see the enemy can use people to trap you and i was just think about this what if i didn't have that excel sheet what would have happened of course there's trust but then i don't have anything to back myself up So the moment he said it, I said, "Hold on, I have everything on Excel." He didn't expect that, and I had the papers. I had everything, all the bills, every bill stapled, kept in a file. What I'm writing here is not simply there; bill is there, and everything that I bought with the bill got it stamped. It's not my own bill or anything. You understand what's happening here? So now there is the what did we want to do? Spiritual aspect. Start a church. but there is a practical aspect as well be very wise at and at a young age i thank god that god protected me god gave me the wisdom to do things in the right way and then we also can learn this right it's not wrong people will come up to you and say i want to support i want to give here i want to let them give but the thing is you make sure that everything is accounted for okay um now bringing correction just a few points there will be cultural problems um people there will be greeks there will be jews different people from different cultures uh you and i must be able to bridge those gaps so for example you may have a person who speaks kannada you have a person who speaks you know another language hindi the hindi person will say how come something you know how come uh no hindi songs kannada person we say how come no kannada song now we must bridge the gap no in north india we do it this way but in south india we do it this way see all of those cultural gaps are there but we all we must learn to bridge those gaps to meet both needs equally right 
Then there are cliches and divisions. First Corinthians 4.21. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a, with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? Now, we know about this, right? The Corinthian church had many problems, internal problems. One was strife, division, people taking sides in ministry. Now, Paul is writing to the church, teaching and instructing the believers in right conduct. Now, he encourages them. He encourages their alignment to what he says and says, and was prepared to deal with it in person if necessary. Now, look at this. Paul recognized the church in Corinth is going through problems. Not one problem, not two problems, but more than three problems. Now, I've told you already, I've written to you already, but I, if I don't see any change, Paul is saying, should I come to you with a rod? or in love and a, of a spirit of gentleness. So Paul is saying, if, if there's any way I need to correct you, I'm going to do it. If there's, a, if there's a way that if you want, if I should come personally and come to Corinth, meet you and discuss these problems, I'm willing to do it. Right. So when there is cliches, when there are divisions in the church, deal with it immediately. Don't when you look at it initially itself, deal with it. Don't let it grow, grow, and grow, and grow. And then there'll come a time you're trying to go, you know, the roots have gone deep. Now we're trying to dig out all the problems, and it's a never-ending story. You see the problem? Deal with it. Right. Uh, there will be moral issues within the church. There will be people within the church, you know, believers, but they're going through problems. They may be into alcohol, they may be into sexual immorality, pornography, uh, whatever, right? There may be moral issues, they may be cheating on their spouse, so many things happening. And now they'll come and tell you, you've got to deal with it. You've got to be able to give them right advice, uh, you know, be able to uh, affirm to them that, hey, you have to change your ways. You may have to be stern at times. Right? Meaning you have to say, listen, what you're doing is wrong. So there's the love and there's the rod. And we have to use both. Right? Now the mistake we make is initially just use the rod every time. No. We must balance it out. Now, our, our main aim is what? Reconciliation and forgiveness. Bring back people to what God wants them to be. That's our main aim. Right? Then we also see in the church was disorderly, disorderly behavior in uh, the church in Thessalonica. Now, uh, I'm just going to read a few portions. Second Thessalonians 3, 6 onwards. Uh, can one of you please read that? Second Thessalonians chapter 3, 6 to 15. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly not, and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourself know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but work with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, yeah. not because we do not have authority. Yeah, we'll just, we'll just stop there. So the main focus here is, uh, Paul is writing, he's saying that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition we received. And Paul goes on to say that we as apostles and prophets and, and ministers of God, we didn't ask any one of you for money. We worked with our own hands. We toiled, we labored, we provided for ourselves, we also provided for others while we did ministry. So there will be times in a church, there will be people who are not living right. For example, a man can be married with children and he says, no, I don't want to work. I'm not getting a good job. Right? Now he's got a wife, he's got children. He can't wait for a good job. He has to take up whatever job he gets and start working. And eventually, God will open that good job for him. right? But he can use it as an excuse. But it's not a good job. He's not working. He's not providing for the home. But he's there for every prayer meeting. He's there for every cell group. 
now you need to correct her and see it's good what you're doing you're serving the lord but more importantly you need to be able to serve your family you have to get a job right get a small job it's okay even if it's a low income it's all right and many times we tell that to people right so there are times people who say no i i had this position and this was the income that i had now how can i go down you have to go down if if you if there's no other opportunity you have to be willing to do it right? because you must understand that you know as a youth it's a different story right you're still not married you're living in your parents with your parents that's a different story altogether the moment you you have responsibilities on yourself you're married you have children you have to be able to provide for them right uh, but as we correct them and we don't see any improvement we don't see any changes now this is just one example what about a person who's you know uh, always into alcohol he comes for prayer he comes to sunday service but the habit of drinking is just not going out of him it's it's it's, it's an ongoing thing and we've been praying talking to them talking to them but we don't see any response or we don't see any any of the uh suggestions that we give them any of the counsel that we give them they're not applying it in their life what do we do so there will be a time when we will have to just stop take a back seat and not befriend them meaning don't involve too much in their lives and eventually they will understand that hey i maybe i'm doing something wrong right uh, now when we say don't befriend them meaning it's not like when you see them turn away and go the other side no say hi say everything but come to a place of just you know start serving people who are willing to take correction who are willing to listen and take counsel and change remember this there are times people will there are some people who are willing to change there are some people who are who want to change but cannot change but there are some people who will who don't want to change in the church right uh you'll find these people i'm not saying many of them but there may be people like this we must be able to uh resolve problems within them then paul is writing about deceiving brethren people within the church who come and deceive people deceive the congregation with false doctrine false ideologies false i you know uh thoughts causing deception causing strife causing confusion causing divisions within the church so you got to be able to recognize them try to resolve the problem if not they may have to be step asked to leave the church then we have the opposing brethren first timothy 1 19 and 20 go ahead shall i brother yes please go ahead lucy having faith and good conscience with some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck of whom are himenius and alexander whom i delivered to satan that they may learn not to blaspheme this right. word of god and look at the other two verses as well both all three verses are from timothy that means what the uh, the the apostle paul is writing to the church in ephesus where timothy is already the pastor there and he's looking at all these are the problems there saying here which some have rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck of whom hymenius and alexander whom i have delivered to satan that they may learn not to blaspheme that means what there were people within the church who are causing opposing doctrines within the church now let me give you an example they may be saying paul paul came and told you about all this apostle paul okay what did he tell you yeah he taught us about jesus he taught us you know all that is good but uh, when where is jesus or uh, how can the blood of jesus wash away our sins now what we can do is it's okay to indulge enjoy the things that are there around us right and then we can ask god for forgiveness deceiving opposing brothers within the church right so what are they doing they're also saying don't believe paul he came he started the church and he's gone right he 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 didn't know what he's talking about he's a jew he's a pharisee forget about him 
Jesus died and he's gone. He's, there's no more. There's no resurrection from the dead. Right? Now, these opposing brothers are people who have wrong doctrines. They promoted their wrong, wrong teachings. Paul addresses this publicly by instructing the believers not to be moved by their teaching and to avoid them. Now, how can we translate this to our the season that we are living in? If you go to YouTube, what is available? Plenty of information is available. Plenty of videos. And I would say 90% of it may not even be true. Okay, maybe not 90, but a but lot of it, maybe 50% of it is, is just opposing doctrines, own ideologies, all kinds of things that are happening in the church especially. So if we know that somebody is wrong, if we know that this is a wrong doctrine, don't have to waste our time there. I'm talking about when we, you and I, as we are watching YouTube or listening to these sermons, and uh, we don't, we know, we don't have to point fingers. Hey, this is wrong. Just leave it, right? Then there will be divisive individuals. Diotrephus is one of them. Let's read Third John one nine through eleven. First John or third John? Third John. Third John. Yeah. Wow. I wrote wow. to the church. I wrote to the church, but their trips, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to the mind his deeds which he does, prating against with malicious words and not content with that. He himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to. Putting them out of the church, beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Right. So here John is writing about Diotrephes, who opposed the Apostle John, as well as prevented believers from being hospitable to traveling ministers. Now, what are these divisive individuals? Now, these are individuals who try to bring in their own thought patterns, their own ideas, and try to impose them on others. It could be something very simple. For example, I can tell Vimal, Vimal, you know what Akhil told me? He told me this. Don't talk to Akhil. This is all uh, you know, school stuff. That's, that's happening in the church. Vimal, Akhil told me this. And he told me in such a harsh way. Now, because of this, I'm very upset. Now, you don't talk to Akhil. Divisive individuals. So I'm what I'm doing is, now, Akhil and Vimal have no problem with each other. But I am trying to bring my thought patterns, my problems, I'm sending it to Vimal. And Vimal now, in his perception and his thinking, OK, Akhil did this. So maybe he'll do it to me next. Or he'll do it to many people. Now, this is just an example, right? <laughs> uh, so we need to be careful with these individuals. Now, remember that see, these people will be there. As a leader, don't immediately say, immediately say OK, uh, you get out of the church. That's not our point. right? Only when you know, certain things go beyond our control we, and we see that the church, the congregation is affected, then we step out. And let things, we ask them to step out, make sure that everything is uh, in line here. Yes, Akhil. Master, how do you actually bridge a gap when you have to correct somebody and when you have to forgive somebody? First question. And the second one, whose ownership is it? Is it only the pastor of the committee or anybody like an elder? Or uh... Yeah. So uh, something that we follow at APC is the three strike policy. OK. So for example, there's a leader. He Now, there are. There are different mistakes that people make now. So in leadership, now if I'm preaching, and example, I the sermon should get over by by twelve o'clock. I go on till twelve fifteen. Now I shouldn't get upset and, as a leader. I've I've given somebody the opportunity. I shouldn't get upset and say, okay, strike one. 
Now, this is not something that is very you know critical. So we have the three strike policy for critical matters, character issues, right? Uh, uh, so for ex so I would say, give them an opportunity, correct them. Okay. So for like main things, right? Like something that's very critical. If it happens again, or it could be another issue, uh, uh, maybe somebody talking about the pastor. Or you know, going to the church members, trying to start gossip among them. These are all like very critical things. So strike two, and you tell them, see, this is your final warning. Uh, after this, anything happens, you will be taken out of leadership. When it's people within the church, give them some grace, give them some time. But again, depends on what, how critical the issue is. And sorry, your second part of the question was. Yeah, so it'll be good to have like a core team with a few elders, take a consensus of all of them. But as the pastor, the leader of the church, you will have to make the final decision. Right. So for example, I can say, okay, Akil, Vimal, Blessy, all of us come, we all sit together. We need to make a decision. So we all talk about it. We say, okay, see, you may say, hey, no, this person is good. He just needs a little more, you know, chance. Or a little more opportunity, give him a chance. A blessing may say, no, we've given him to a chance, but this is critical. And uh, I may say, yeah, but you know, we all make mistakes. Can we, you know, give him like three months of time? Let's see how he does in three months, or give him six months. Uh, let's see whether he's improving, whether he's taking our feedback. And finally, Akil, as you as the pastor of the church or the leader, you will make the decision. But you're taking a consensus. Right? So it'll be good to have like a core team. Like some people, you know, even Jesus did that, right? Peter, he had his 12, but he had his three, Peter, James, and John. So it'd be good to just now those three people should, or three or four, the, that core team should be people who are wise, spiritually mature. Uh, they know how to deal with people. You know, they they should have some kind of experience in leadership, uh, ministering in the church. All of that should be there. Hmm? Yeah. Now comes the difficult part, correcting leaders. Uh, just, there's a question here from Biju on the chat. Uh, as a pastor, how to deal with elder people who are having a lot of life experiences, but spiritually babes and unwilling to unlearn and listen to God's counsel? Yes, that's, that's a very, very important question, very practical question. So. But you see, we must understand that times and ch seasons are changing, right? Now, it's, let me give you this example. You may have an elderly couple in the church. Now, they all like hymns, the old hymns. And I love hymns. Hymns are beautiful. But now, in a church, you have youth. We are in a generation where there's contemporary worship. Right? Loud guitars and drums and a full band. Now, these old... Older folks may not like it. So it is my responsibility as a leader to go to those, to the elderly folks and say, hey, uh, see, I understand that, you know, we all grew up with hymns. We all grew up with these kind of songs. But now we are targeting the next generation. Right? One generation has passed. We are in a new generation. And we have to target them. We have to keep in timing with what the world is doing. right? So if I keep singing hymns, I may not be able to attract youth to the church. They may not be able to come. And you know, my ministry is limited. So the best thing to do is to speak to them, help them to understand first why we are doing it. right? Uh, and even after that, if they still you know, say no, because, you know, they, if they still want it their way, then what you can do is you can uh, try and encourage them to be part of a smaller fellowship, maybe life groups, cell groups. Uh, and here you may have to go personally, just spend time with them. And especially if they are, uh, you know, uh, senior citizens, elderly folks attending the church, uh, uh, just a little bit of additional care as a leader will re really impact their lives. Right? Uh, but if there is a constant 
you know, they they they, they don't feel that their need has been met. Um, you know, it's hard to tell them, uh, but what we can do is do our best to serve them, right? If they are not able to, then there's nothing more that we can do. You can let them know. See, this is oh, this is as much as we can do. We are doing for you, but we must also be aware of uh, the generation, the people that we are serving. And so I think, Biju, we we just need to talk to them, help them to understand. Right. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Now, correcting leaders. First Timothy five nineteen through twenty two. Let's read that. Can I read, Pastor? Yes, yes. Please go ahead, Gertrude. First Timothy five nineteen to twenty two. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear i charge you before god and the lord jesus christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice doing nothing with partiality do not lay hands on anyone hastily no share in other people's sins keep yourself pure yeah thank you gertrude now correcting leaders this you know as a as a leader we must understand that we are not perfect and we have leaders under us who are not perfect now they will make uh, mistakes something that we uh, always emphasize at at apc is that we correct in private we honor and applaud in public we encourage in public, but we correct them in private. So as a leader, we must develop this ability to protect the people who are there with us. And I'm not saying we don't give correction. We have to give correction, right? But we must also be able to learn, the, the, have the ability to correct them in private, but honor them in public. Because they are your leaders. You have appointed them. And you must stand by them. You know, uh, look at this example. Jesus, he has resurrected from the dead. He comes back. And uh, now he's meeting with the disciples. What does he do? So beautiful. All the disciples are there sitting there. Did Jesus come and say, ah, Peter, remember that I told you before the cock crows, what will you do? You will deny me. See, I told you, no. I told you, you'll do it. I know what you are. I know what you will do. Did Jesus say that? He so beautifully protected him. He didn't bring out his failures there. But he restored him. Three times he denied me. Three times he asked him, who do you say I am? Restored him back. Right? And that's the perfect example of a leader. It's very easy to correct in public. But we must develop that ability. OK. Place honor. If somebody is, you know, for example, somebody is uh, preaching, you give your associate pastor to preach, right? In front of all of them, say, thank you, well done, all of it. But in private, whatever you feel, you have to give feedback, correction, give it. Right? And I've received plenty, and I'm glad I received it. Right? But in public, I've received a lot of appreciation from our pastors. But I've also you know, receive correction. See, when you preach, you say like this. Right? One of the things I always remember is, uh, I remember this early years, I got this feedback. Uh, I was preaching in one of the locations here at APC, and uh, I kept saying, when you do this, when you do this, God will bless you, and God will, you know. And then uh, after the whole thing, I got a feedback saying, don't say you, say us, say we. Because even we, I am included, and that stuck into my mind, right? It, these are simple things, but these feedbacks are something that we can work on and learn. Then, restoring fallen ministers, Galatians six one. Go ahead, read that, please. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in his trespass, in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. 
considering yourself lest also you be tempted yeah now this is a very difficult uh you know thing to do but as a pastor and a leader when people you see and uh, who you are overseeing step or fall into sin it is our responsibility to ensure that we love them bring healing bring restoration but it is also our responsibility not to ignore the problem don't take the problem and put it under the carpet and say okay it's fine no we bring correction we tell them hey this is really wrong so you will be you know you'll uh, you'll have to go through a bit of a counseling with us as a team take a break for three months but what we want to see is in this three months that you are restored to understand that we love you we care for you you are our leader you are we will all, you are uh, you are with us we are with you we want to help you to get back to your feet right but this is a big problem so we need time to resolve this problem and we deal with the problem yet we are loving and kind our end goal is to see them restored back right so you can also tell them see uh, as a leader you take a break for 6 months in this 6 months you be there be in the church serve in the church but you won't be preaching and teaching you can serve in any other area but you will be we are there to counsel you to to help you and after 6 months as we see we look at your life we see that there's changes we'll slowly give you the opportunity to go ahead and preach right so now what you're doing is you're restoring them which is the heart of god but you're also bringing correction there's a consequence to the mistake that they have made it's not like you make mistakes there's no consequence you go back and say sorry and then continue with life no there are consequences there are mistakes we make we have to deal with those consequences but our end result is we want people to be restored okay um, exercising authority without abuse shall we take a break we'll take a break we'll come back and uh, we can spend more time on this we'll take a break